Um, okay, I'll get started. So just um, thank you to everyone for joining, uh, joining this webinar. My name's Andrew Hyde. I'm from Cambridge University Press, and we're really pleased to be here um, with six editors now of um, the new open access journal, Environmental Data Science. So we have um, Claire Monteleone, um, Editor-in-Chief. We have um, Jakob Brunga, um, Julianne Brackard, um, Iniko Sezekli, uh, sorry if I've mispronounced that, and Mig Miguel Macheca, um, and I believe um, Dorit Hameling will be joining us a bit later as well. Hopefully I haven't missed anyone there. Um, and um, we'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask the editors to introduce themselves and talk about their research interests shortly. Um, just to let everyone in the, in the webinar know that this is being recorded. Um, and the format is quite informal. We've got some pre-scripted um, questions that we're going to go through um, um, about this, this interface between AI, data science and the environmental sciences. But we do encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A and through the chat function. And I'll keep an eye on um, both of those and, um, and put those uh, to, to the editors. Um, so um, before I ask everyone to introduce themselves, I will um, just share my screen. Um, hopefully this works. So um, the reason we're here is um, uh, we recently launched um, a new um, open access journal called Environmental Data Science, which, um, uh, which you can see here. So, um, this is a, a journal dedicated to, to this interface between um, artificial intelligence, data science, and the environmental sciences. We're open for submissions now, and um, we're encouraging the submissions of uh, methods papers um, uh, that use novel data science methods inspired by environmental problems or environmental applications, and um, application papers um, tackling problems um, in an environmental field enabled by data science um, and AI or AI. And you can see a list of editors here. Um, to give you a breadth, uh, give you a sense of the breadth of the journal, um, here are the kind of data and methodological scope and the environmental scope. So we're defining kind of data science um, very broadly. And um, lastly, um, five reasons to submit. Um, so I will leave those on the screen for you. Um, but to perhaps to sort of stress that, you know, we're an open access journal, so we um, we make all of the content openly available under Creative Commons licensing, um, and we're particularly keen on forming alignments with conferences and workshops. You know, at this interface. So, if you do have, um, if you are someone who's working, um, it, you know, with a group of people on a conference and a workshop, and you're wondering where a kind of natural home for um, the review and publication of that material could be, and um, please do get in touch with us. There's some more details, um, more details down there. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen now, and perhaps I will kind of um, start by asking um, each of the editors to introduce themselves. So um, and to talk a little bit about their research interests. I think that would be a good way to kick off. So um, I'll start with Claire. So Claire, could you could you say a few words about yourself? Hi, yeah, welcome to the webinar. I hope folks submit to environmental data science. We've already started receiving submissions. Um, so I'm Claire Monteleone. I'm a computer science professor who is interested in applying AI and machine learning um, to problems involving um, climate change and um, other major environmental challenges. Uh, and it seemed like we needed a place, a journal, um, to, to showcase these sorts of works. We've been having a climate informatics conference for over a decade, and we do have conference proceedings, but um, as many of you know, there's papers that you publish in your domain journals um, where maybe the methods aren't, um, don't need to be, you know, focused on but a lot of people are seeing the power of machine learning to really advance their research. And we'd like to provide a journal uh, to showcase that. 
So um, I'll hand it over now to Julien. Yes. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so yeah, I'm Julien Braja. I'm a researcher uh, at uh, Nansen Center in uh, Bergen, uh, Norway. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm researcher. I'm, I'm interested at uh, using and developing machine learning uh, approaches for general climate science questions. Um, more specifically, uh, what I'm interested in is uh, improving the model, numerical model prediction of the environment and of the climate by using uh, both uh, data and also physical principles. And, uh, and especially with the remote sensing data and uh, ocean data, but not, not exclusively. So uh, my work actually for a long time has been at the crossroad of uh, several domains like uh, numerical modeling, uh, data assimilation, machine learning, oceanography. And uh, as a researcher that has worked on a pluridisciplinary field, so not, not a domain specific field, uh, I'm very happy to, 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 to be here and uh, discuss uh, uh, the opportunity of uh, having a, a publication in uh, environmental data science, because I, I think that that's something that uh, is needed for, for this type of, um, of the work and, and the work I'm doing. So yeah, I'm very happy to, to, to participate to this, uh, to this adventure. Um, perhaps um, Jakob could go next. Yeah, sure. I'm Jakob Runge and I'm heading the Climate Informatics Group at the German Aerospace Center in Jena. And uh, since February, I'm professor, a guest professor at Technical University Berlin on the same uh, chair called Climate Informatics. So I'm, my research has been always at the heart of this uh, enterprise that we are talking about here. And it's great to see now this being more, yeah, more grounded in, in such a journal and uh, to see that this came from the Climate Informatics Workshop Series. So I'm really excited that this is uh, kicking off and bringing this uh, more into, yeah, the overlap between the methodological communities and the climate and environmental science in general. Jakob. So I'm just working across the screen and maybe I'll invite Aniko to say something about herself and her research interests. Um, yeah, so I'm Aniko Sege. I'm uh, at the uh, EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique in uh, Switzerland at the Swiss Data Science Centre. And I started working, actually after the end of my PhD, I was looking to apply machine learning for climate and this is about seven, eight, ten years ago. And there was, it was really difficult to find something. It took me a while um, to, to find something at the intersection. Um, and then some, I think in 2015 or 2014, I attended climate informatics in Boulder. Um, and it was a really nice um, workshop, uh, really nice interaction. So that's when I started to be involved with climate informatics. Um, and every year, we realized that uh, we had the computer science or machine learning community and the domain science community, they had very different uh, publishing uh, strategies. In computer science, one publishes eight, 10, 14 page papers um, uh, in conference proceedings, while in uh, climate, it's more like longer journals and short versions. Uh, and uh, there was this need to find something a little bit common, especially that we see now how really fast this is growing. There are so many communities and climate change AI. And uh, yeah, so I think there was a need and uh, it's great to see these things like, like coming along. Yeah. Thank you, Nico. Um, Miguel, could you introduce yourself and your research, your area of research? Yes, thank you. Yeah, my name is Miguel Maecha. I'm a professor at Leipzig University, Germany, in a new center for remote sensing. Uh, and coincidentally, I'm heading a group which is called Earth System Data Science. So <laughs> this really fits perfectly with my research. So my background is actually on, on ecology and ecosystem research. And um, when I did my, before I started my PhD, actually, my, my first papers were actually on nonlinear dimensionality reduction. And I had a very hard time to get papers using such crazy methods uh, in ecology, uh, there was simply no, no way to publish that at all. It was very difficult. And since then, I'm always kind of 
uh, kept trying to, to, to follow this, this methods development in, in the informatics and machine learning community and apply that to environmental sciences. And I've moved myself more into land atmosphere interactions, into the role of climate extremes for ecosystems and ecosystem functioning in the carbon cycle. And today, uh, with all this uh, advent of machine learning, um, we, we have really a completely different perspective to also exploit the emerging data cubes that you have from satellites, from ground-based data, from the integration of both. And so I'm, I'm just super excited that this new channel kicked off because this is really where I would say <laughs> I feel at home. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to, to collaborate here. Thank you, Miguel. And really pleased to see we've got a couple of other editors who've joined the panel. Um, we've got Dorit Hameling. Um, could you introduce yourself, Dorit? Yeah, welcome everyone. So I'm Dorit Hameling. I work at the Colorado School of Mines. I'm an associate professor for applied mathematics and statistics. And before that, I worked at ENCA, which is the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. I ran the stats group there for some years and then worked in the machine learning group. I was there for a total of maybe seven years and I still work very closely with a lot of researchers from ENCA. So I'm specialized in computational statistics for massive data. I work a lot with satellite data and climate model output and develop a lot of methods in this direction and lossy compression data. And uh, from a research perspective with scientists, I work a lot of air quality. That's why I'll be the editor for air quality. Yeah. Very excited about this new journal, and I think as we have heard here, it's not always easy to publish on the interface, and you know, especially interface computer science if statistics comes in the mix too, makes it even more complicated. Yeah, so glad to work with all of you. Thank you, Dorit. And lastly, we've got Anastas as well. Um, Anastas, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your research? Yes, hello everyone. I'm Anastas Antonis. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Ecole Nationale Supérieure d'informatique pour l'industrie et l'entreprise, NCO, in, in, in nearby Paris. Uh, uh, I teach deep learning, but mostly my research is uh, applied on machine and deep learning for mostly oceanographic, but not only problems. And I'm mostly interested in uh, dealing, uh, inverting uh, 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 um, vertical distributions of different uh, geo uh, geophysical parameters based on satellite imaging and solving issues with missing uh, values, missing data. How to do machine learning when, when the quality of the data is poor due to clouds or due to lacking observations. I'm very excited for the channel too, but you have already heard all the reasons why I'm excited by all the other of the panel. Anastas. Um, okay, so um, just a reminder to everyone who's attending that you should feel free to um, put questions into the chat and into the Q&A and, um, and we will kind of get to them. Um, so Claire, I, I don't know how you want to handle this, but we've got some pre-scripted um, questions. I could perhaps um, just um, ask, uh, go, go through those and perhaps we can kind of end up directing, directing them to the panel accordingly. Um, so, so one idea, some of us in our introduction started to answer one of these questions that I see, why do we need a new publishing venue for environmental data science when there are already a lot of journals and proceedings? Should we give other panelists a chance to weigh in on that? That would be excellent, yes. Um, oh, and there's already questions in the chat. Okay, so a uh, question in the chat, do you think the journal will be indexed next year? Um, we will be applying, of course, to all of the relevant indexes. Um, uh, I think after, after one full year of publications, we'll be um, applying for the Emerging Sources Citation Index, which is a web of science index. So maybe that's what you're referring to. It does take a while for a journal to get uh, indexed in the sense of getting an impact factor. So that will take more than more than a year, but um, hopefully that answers that question. But yeah, could um, could I open that question about why we need a new venue up to to anyone who who would like to answer it? Well, personally, I have a, a feeling that whenever I publish, I either end up being reviewed by people that are very much experts uh, on uh, the 
the applied field and therefore uh, they have high difficulties understanding the subtleties of uh, the algorithms that we are using or if I am applying for in a, a journal where the, the it's more machine learning uh, well the the issues and the problems that we have in geosciences are very specific and they they don't value that much uh, this uh, work and they do not really understand the problematic as much and very often uh, we end up having being reviewed uh, and having questions asked that uh, are not really uh, connected to the community. So very often it's a, a ser serious problem that I personally encounter. But it is why I'm very excited for this journal. But having a community of people that you know uh, that are on, in the intersection of those two fields and are able to provide adequate feedback and understand the importance and the difficulties of uh, the methods used and uh, the, the things that it can bring to, to the community as a whole. Actually, that's a really good point. I just wanted to comment that we chose editors to a point who are already um, doing environmental data science in that maybe they started as a domain expert but really learned the machine learning literature to make an impact, or they started as a algorithmic machine learner like myself, or a you know hardcore theoretical st statistician like Dorit, but then got very excited about environmental applications. So that's at the editor level, but we would welcome reviewers with deep domain expertise and data science expertise, or just one of each, because each paper will be reviewed by at least one person in domain and at least one person on the methodology and data science side. To, to add to that, uh, what I think a goal of such a journal is to, from the method side, to present those methods in a way that um, the community can, can understand them and better see how, how that can uh, also enrich their, their research. So it's, it's not just good uh, being able to, to publish there, of course, uh, because it's more fairly uh, assessed by, by our board of uh, editors, but it's also a task for everyone submitting to, to present your methods in a way that uh, it is accessible. Um, and therefore, yeah, give a much farther um, reach and uh, to, to the community. Because I think the methodologists, they, they're often quick at popping out new methods in, in, in the conference journals, but uh, it takes quite a while for these methods to be appreciated by the community, which is uh, a large gap in understanding. And uh, a goal of this journal for me also is to bridge that gap in, in making them, with the help of the editorial process, uh, more accessible. Actually, that's a great point. I found that um, we would always invite a machine learning speaker um, to our workshop in climate informatics. And we said, please, please, give it, um, give the talk in a very clear way that the scientists and the other domains will understand. And those were some of the best machine learning talks I went to because, um, you know, people were explaining things from first principles and we kind of got really good quality uh, talks that way. And so we're also hoping to get good quality publications and this could also impact other fields. So I've given, talks about a new idea or a new AI algorithm where the talk was completely motivated by a problem in the environmental sciences, but had a business school professor come up and talk to me afterwards. And it led to a collaboration about predicting the, the stock market. So some of these applications that are really important for the environment can cause us to develop new AI that will actually also impact other fields. Um, I, just to add, I think also um, in in math and machine learning, there are so many algorithms out there, but it's really difficult to apply them to real data. So they might work on toy examples and digits and handwritten digits, but to make them work on real data, this gets really complicated. And um, without this work where it's published, it's going to be difficult to have them accepted. 
And I think there is uh, not, right now there is such a strong tendency towards explainability and interpretability. And the, if one wants uh, domain sciences to adopt machine learning, not just as a black box, I think we need journals, we need lengthy articles where to explain why it works, how did we choose the parameters, what's the robustness, and um, it's a it's a, it's a lot of work, I guess, and uh, we need a space where all this is like documented somehow. Uh, so Doug, Doug has a question. Um, we do um, give badges for open code and open data. There's some additional badges that'll come with your paper if you have open code and data, but we're not at this point requiring it. So don't let that be a barrier to entry, um, but we are all for it. Miguel? Yeah, I just wanted to add still on Nico's Jakob's points, maybe if I may. Um, very briefly, I mean, what, what I think um, that is also very important now is that we have this really this dual quality check here from the domain science and from the data science perspective so is that um, what I have seen a couple of times is that methods that are so easy to use because just the algorithms are applicable lead to a very naive way of doing environmental sciences with it, um, ignoring basically the particularities of, of our system data. Yeah, we are operating on a sphere, we are operating with autocorrelated data, we have no IID samples and so forth. Yeah, and that of course poses new challenges for, 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 the, for the applicability of, of certain methods. I mean, I think it's a little, little along the lines what has been said before, but I think it's very important to, to, to think about the transfer and, and to have a space where this is discussed. Okay, we could go 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 back to some of the the the, the, the questions we scripted in advance. Um, so there were um, maybe a couple of uh, sort of methods related questions. Um, one was to what extent are environmental scientists adopting data driven methods, or is environmental data science really being done by computer scientists? Um, so would anyone like to answer that question? I think there's a huge uptake of machine learning methods. Um, but what's important about peer review and getting together a bunch of experts to be editors and reviewers is sort of along the lines of what Jacob said. It's very easy to download somebody's code and play around with it, but not understanding the purpose of different hyperparameters or what you're trying to get out of it or having issues around interpretability will not really help the advance of the field. So I'm definitely seeing um, in EGU, AGU, a huge uptake of these um, methods. But you know, one thing I would encourage any, any domain scientist would be to, to actually collaborate with someone in um, data science as well to make sure that, um, that you can interpret the outcome. You're not accidentally using a default parameter set, hyperparameter setting that doesn't necessarily make sense for your setting. So um, yes, there's a huge uptake, um, but you know sometimes it's it's hard to interpret the results, or we shouldn't take the the conclusions completely um, without without peer review. You know they do need to be peer reviewed by someone in data science. Um. Maybe one thing is also, I mean, in, in machine learning, we have the supervised versus unsupervised learning. And for supervised, we have very clear metrics to estimate that what we do makes sense. For unsupervised learning, that's absolutely not, not the case. It's, uh, it's, it's so difficult to interpret things. Um, and usually if we apply this unsupervised learning method on an easy data set, we can see easily if it makes sense or not. Um, but uh, yeah, I think in this case, definitely reviewers from domain science will say if what one does makes sense or not. Um, so, okay, maybe a, a quick quick comment about that. Sorry, Andrew. Uh, to to yeah, to following what uh, Nico says because. Uh, Actually, the, the environmental scientists have used data science uh, like for a very, very long time, but data science was 
uh, linear regression, uh, very simple linear dimensionality reductions, uh, and so on. So I think, I think uh, now there is a need to have a new method because we have new type of problems, new type of observations. And uh, sometimes what, uh, as Eniko say, what, what is um, maybe uh, a challenge to, for, for uh, the geoscience as a domain to, to adopt this, this new method is uh, the uh, explainability or the, the, um, the trust worth of, of this method. And I, I think there is a, um, yeah, I, I think that's why there, 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 there is a need of a real close collaboration between uh, environmental, climate, and data scientists to 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 make those methods uh, explainable and, and useful for 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 the community, and I think also that uh, environmental uh, scientists can also um, uh, uh, propose or ask very uh, exciting and very beautiful new problems that can also uh, encourage the development of new way of new methods in in data science so i i think this is a two-way uh, two-way collaboration yes, especially in the term of metrics for me it's very very useful because uh, in our field uh, using in machine learning and deep learning you end up using the same metrics all the time but rmsc is not always the best metric of uh, if your if your model is doing something uh, correctly, especially in oceanography and meteorology and all those fields, there, there might be invariants, physical invariants that you can only find uh, in that field. So it, it, uh, collaborating with data scientists can lead to, uh, 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 with uh, environmental scientists can lead to much better uh, asks, or, uh, que que you have to ask better questions of the, of the algorithm and the have better coherence. Okay, I mean, we have another methods um, related question here. Um, would someone like to answer what are some of the methods that you're excited about seeing um, in articles submitted to the journal? So, Actually, maybe we could first take that in the direction to show how broad our methods are. Um, so one area that I've been pushing for a long time is around online learning. And this is starting to be really exciting in industry. So you go to a standard machine learning conference and suddenly online learning is really hot. Again, things like you know quickly deciding when to show a user an ad that they might click on is what it's used for in industry. But um, in, in machine learning, it's these um, extremely lightweight methods um, to learn where training and testing are sort of integrated. So you're always updating your model. You don't need a lot of memory. Um, and you're able to adapt should the sort of concept that you're trying to learn actually vary over time. We've also worked when it varies over location. But there's so many different um, methodology expertise represented here. Um, Jakob, could you say a word about causality? Yeah, so that's uh, really what, what my focus is in my work. And I actually came to that whole uh, field from being a physicist from the environmental sciences and trying to answer questions of uh, cause and effect uh, from the data, which um, I found not sufficiently addressed by correlation methods, uh, to say the least. And that led me actually deep into, into that field. And I would hope, or I'm, I'm trying to push this, of course, uh, more in the community, because I think there's that's a particular um, concept that is quite relevant uh, for environmental sciences, because um, in many in many tasks or research questions, it's it's about understanding the processes, understanding how they are interlinked, and uh, maybe not just predicting them without being interested in in how um, these predictions are grounded and how they can be explained. So, this is maybe something that is that is different from from some other fields where experimentation is easily uh, available. And this yeah, this question of how things work together is something that I think. Um, leads naturally to causal inference. And um, two years ago, I wrote um, also with some of the attendees here, uh, a prospective paper on, 
which questions can be addressed in, in climate or earth sciences in general by, by causal uh, inference methods. And uh, yeah, if you look up the Nature Communications Perspective paper 2019, you will see an overview of uh, what, what is out there, what kind of questions can be addressed. But it's also targeted towards the methodologist um, in, in raising all kinds of issues that have been mentioned here, like missing data, non-stationarity, um, the weather system being chaotic, um, autocorrelation uh, and unobserved variables. So this is all something where I frequently see um, the method side being underdeveloped. So maybe there is a solution to one particular problem, but, but usually in, in, in climate science, you have five of them at the same time. And that is always for me also, I, I have to tell them, well, I'm, I'm trying to work out this, this first one and then we see, but it takes a long time, but it, it starts this process. So yeah, does other do other people want to speak up about their methodology um, frameworks? Well, some of the things I'm interested in seeing more of is treating noise. I think noise in environmental applications is often quite tricky and can really vary over space and time. And I think we're lacking in that kind of methodology. And you already mentioned non-stationarity. I think we cannot say that enough uh, because so many of the methods assume stationarity and also, non-stationarity isn't just one recipe to deal with this. There's discontinuous non-stationarity and, and smoothly varying non-stationarity. So I think that's very, and how that actually affects modeling frameworks and the results. And again, uncertainty quantification in that context. So there's a lot of work to do in this specific area. I, mean, I mentioned before this question of dimensionality reduction, and I think it's still highly relevant today. I mean, with um, with deep learning approaches, we can really maybe get to a point where we understand what is the intrinsic dynamics in systems, uh, at least this is the hope. Um, and um, even more if you combine it with some process understanding. And I think in this direction of unsupervised method, I mean, this has been mentioned also before in general, I think there's a lot of things to do that, uh, that uh, could be very enlightening in, in times where people say that we are getting too many data, although yeah, but, but the question is, let's say, what, what is really the added information of, of having, having more and more data streams? And I think this is very important. Yeah, I'm, I'm particularly interested in unsupervised learning. Um, that said, as we mentioned, there are some issues with evaluating their outputs, um, but I'm interested in advances in evaluating generative models. Um, Julia has done some interesting work where you've got your mathematical model, so some sort of differential equation or system of differential equations, and then you're learning an emulator for part of it. Do you want to yeah. speak to that? Yeah, yeah. What, what, uh, so what I'm interested in, I, actually, it's very nice you, you, because you, you said all the key words that I, I wanted to, to, to address and, and, and to say, and, and uh, uncertainty quantification, non-stationarity, non that are really uh, key problems. And actually, one way to... to, to to address that uh, is is, um, is is maybe to 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 assess some uh, physical principle that we already know and and we can constrain uh, the the machine learning process or or improve the physical process by machine learning uh, and and we can use make use of this uh, physical knowledge that we, we we have for for a very long time. So what what I'm interested in is how you. How you 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 how works the interplay between the physical modeling and, and the machine learning? How how each of each of each of the part can help the other to 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 make progress? Progress, I mean, in understanding the processes and progress in in uh, predict predicting uh, uh, predicting the, the the predicting the system. And 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 for, yeah, for example, to, for for what I, I've done, I'm I'm using the the physical model to to. For, for I'm using the physical model to 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 simulate the dynamical part that we know works like that, and machine learning to simulate what has not been uh, represented well by the by the physical model, mm -hmm. and uh, constrained all, all that constrained by uh, noisy non-stationary sparse data. So it makes it makes things 
uh, I don't know who who said that we have several problems at the time. I think it was uh, Jacob. So it may it or, or Nico. I'm, I don't remember. But uh, yeah, it it makes things very complicated, uh, of course. But that that also makes things very exciting. <clears throat> I have one more thing, clear, if I may add that. Uh, different spatial support. I think one something that's very specific to environmental sciences is that we measure things, let's say, from satellite and we have sensors on the ground and how to bring this together in a modeling framework and explicitly account for that. That's also a very difficult problem that isn't normally dealt with in, in usual statistics or machine learning frameworks. And it's pretty challenging, especially in the context of the noise aspects to consider. So we've, we've talked a lot about methods. Should we, would it make sense to switch to applications and to perhaps ask for examples of um, environmental problems um, that have been um, addressed using data science and AI, successful, um, in, so successful examples of environmental data science in that sense. Um, would anyone like to, to take that one on? So I can talk about something uh, that's a work in progress. So if we really want to reduce, um, you know, our consumption of fossil fuel and address climate change, um, there has to be financial incentives to drastically shift over to renewable energy. And at least in the U.S., while there are, you know, very promising uh, sources for solar and wind energy, the, if you're trying to forecast them, there's still a lot of variance and uncertainty. So if you're a grid operator, there's this sort of cost in uncertainty of, of switching to a solar source or a wind source because the uncertainty hasn't been quantified well or alternatively, the forecasts have too much variance. So, you know, there's a whole branch of machine learning that really focused on, focuses on forecasts down to, to real time, right? Seconds ahead for wind is needed, minutes ahead for um, solar. And so um, I, I see that as a big opportunity and we're trying to, I mean, I'm collaborating with people working on renewable energy to try to get better real time forecasts. Um, and it's just a very clear path from there to grid operators being able to adopt these more reliably, more efficiently, and at better cost. Maybe a totally different <laughs> application area that I find just personally very exciting <laughs> is uh, what you can do now with, with, with smartphones and citizen sciences. So, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, so there's the smartphones that can recognize plant species in the field, for example, with an accuracy that is uh, actually ex uh, at a level of, of expert botanist. Yeah, so uh, in, in Germany, Switzerland, for example, there's uh, one application called Flora Incognita that has now been really at, basically used as a reference in the books as well. So and uh, botanist may has the same error rate like this app. Yeah, and those data that you that you collect for that transform the field of biodiversity research because in principle, with so many people using that, you can really empower uh, the field and you can really um, get large coverages of, of inventories of species. I mean, it has biases, of course, and that's not coordinated and there's a lot of problems in that. But you can learn and you can probably at a certain point um, monitor change in, 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 in decent time. You don't need 20 years to make a monitoring of a, of a large area. And things like that, I mean, this is just one example in biodiversity research. I mean, you have a naturalist which covers all types of uh, organisms. Those data go into the big biodiversity databases and so forth. Um, you have the same for all kind of um, landscape metrics, whatever can, can be done with that land cover and so forth. I think there's a lot of potential there that is completely underused. Um, and uh, where, we, where we also need to think about how to extract information um, that is unbiased. And this is actually very difficult because it has no sampling design. Um I may have, yeah, uh, something I'd like to, to mention um, uh, that 
Now the the earth system models are at a point where you can have very good uh, uh, sub seasonal up to decadal prediction of the earth system for some quantities. And if you do that, the 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 error of the models they 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 are uh, they are a problem. The models have used error and bias, and uh, and for that uh, I think machine learning is uh, really a venue that that could uh, help uh, improving those sub seasonal to to decadal uh, forecast of the. Uh, Earth model system, so it's not the same uh, time scale as the renewable energy, but I think so. It, there is a whole range of time scale where you, where you can use uh, machine learning, and, and I think especially for this type of uh, forecast, uh, and and also to have regional uh, um, forecast uh, uh, at the decadal scale, that that's very very um, important, I think, and useful. Um, do you want to move on, Andrew, or can I add? Please do, um, in any case. So, I mean, I can talk about, I, I've worked a lot of uh, nonlinear dimension reduction and unsupervised, and I think this still, I, it's a topic that I like a lot. But uh, so recently I'm working on detection and attribution of climate change. And um, uh, even with very simple statistical learning methods, we were able to show that now we can see the climate change in every single day since 2012. Um, and then if we want to go to attribution to see which is the cause, uh, we need to go also a little bit towards more causal methods and distributional robustness where this is a difficult problem in machine learning because we are training on one distribution and this might not extrapolate well to another distribution. So um, there is a lot of work and it, it's actually really exciting to see that um, it, it's, it's so challenging. It's so a lot of brainstorming to, to work on this kind of applications. Okay. Um, so uh, we still haven't had any more questions through the chat or Q&A. So just to... Um, ah, here we have one from uh, Michael Holloway. Um, so I will read this one out. Um, what do the panel think about the role of digital platforms that help facilitate the collaborations between domain experts and data scientists? For example, um, virtual labs that help an environmental scientist understand complex machine learning methods and how they can how they can be applied to the environmental challenge appropriately. Um, is there, would anyone like to to um, to take on that question from Michael Holloway? Yeah, that's great. And I mean, as Jakob said, papers in this journal could also serve as explainers of some of these these methods. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll quickly plug at my university, there's something called earthdatascience.org, um, where Earth Lab for a long time has been pushing this idea of, you know, the methods are only as useful as the extent to which the pipelines are reproducible the software is openly available and earth scientists are um, can receive trainings on how to use them. So I would encourage people to check out earthdatascience.org. Um, they put out open textbooks and um, reproducible software pipelines and also have trainings on how to package your, your software into a reproducible pipeline. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I'll go back to our um, to our set of questions. Um, so we had one from um, from Alex um, Carrick at um, CUP, uh, which was how can um, new environmental data science techniques be integrated with um, traditional environmental modeling techniques to make informed decisions for the future? Um, is that something that um, anyone would like to answer? Yeah, there's a really exciting field around um, physics constrained or physics informed machine learning. Um, that's something that I'd say uh, Julien uh, works on. Um, I mean, in, in a publication itself, certainly if you're presenting results, you should compare them against state of the art from the field that you're comparing to. But then there's a lot of really exciting advances on how to integrate the two. Uh, 
Yeah, if I can um, second that, I mean, so I think also the, the question of explainability is always very high in environmental sciences. You want to know why a species is distributed in a certain way. You want to understand why an extreme event has a certain impact on forests or not. Yeah, and, and, and just making the prediction itself is often not enough. So, and, and traditional methods are good in the sense that because they are often linear, it's kind of <laughs> transparent what's happening and achieving similar transparency in, in AI is not, not trivial. And I think this is a very, very fast moving field and needs to address, let's say, with a, yeah, very deeply in, in, in order to really empower those methods or really make also the transfer to, 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 up, to the applied side of the story. And um, because this is, I think, a prerequisite for credibility. Okay. Um, so we're, we're, we're coming towards the end. Uh, we've still got a couple of other questions that uh, we've kind of phrased in advance. Um, so I think Miguel um, has already touched upon this in one of his answers, but um, I wanted to ask um, what is the role of citizen science within um, environmental data science? Would anyone like to, to ask that? So, um, citizen science can be really helpful for some of these biological surveys that Miguel mentioned. Um, there's a eBird project in the US where people observe birds and it's great for tracking migrations. Um, but the other way is also um, taking the societal piece into account. So apps are starting to be developed such that um, if you're on the ground in a city being affected by poor air quality, you can both be notified, but you can also um, share feedback. So this helps identify places where there's environmental injustices, where a community is being put too close to, or a pollution site is being put too close to a community. So um, bringing stakeholders into the picture so that citizen science is not just about citizens being used as sensors to create data about the science, but these phones can be used as sensors um, in terms of how, how the environment and also, you know, engineered changes to the environment are affecting people's health outcomes and day-to-day -day life. So there are studies at my university by Shelley Miller and others doing um, apps around air quality for communities um, near uh, construction sites or other polluting um, man-made <laughs> interventions. Great, um, thank you, Claire. So um, um, maybe just a quick last call for any questions from uh, the attendees uh, in the Q&A or the chat. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we've talked a bit about open open data and open code. Um, I wondered whether there was anything else that we should be looking to do uh, within the policies of the journal or within the publishing practices of the journal to encourage more reproducible um, research. Um, for example, how important do people think um, 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 open notebooks, Jupyter notebooks, etc., are kind of it for 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 science going forward? Um, would anyone like to um, to talk a little bit more about what we can do to encourage um, openness and reproducibility? So the journal itself will be um, open in that the, the papers are freely available. Um, looks like Jakob had a comment. No, yeah, I mean, it is part of the of the review process to to encourage that and to to make people uh, do that. So that's that's um, what what we can do from the editorial and reviewing side. And of course, it's always a little bit of a barrier, but maybe in the process uh, we can actually help and not just set this uh, as an entry barrier, but but help uh, the authors uh, in this process. Um, and maybe there's more that. Uh, Cambridge University Press can also do in this, uh, but it, it will be something that the editors and, and we all can, can help with.
Okay, I think um, I think we we've, we've we've more or less reached the end of the of the questions that we've had. I just see there's there's a, a question in the chat, one in, one in the Q and A. Uh, so from um, Colorado Reed, uh, follow up question from um, Jacob's uh, Nature paper posted in the chat. Do any of the panelists have an example of a high impact paper that they they could suggest at the intersection of AI and climate sciences, their own or someone else's? So does anyone want to uh, plug their own sort of published research? So Vipin Kumar's group at the University of Minnesota um, used some pretty simple data science techniques to discover a new dipole that hadn't been studied before by climate scientists. I believe it was like off the coast of um, Australia and somewhere in the Indian Ocean. Um, that, that was interesting. I would also recommend people look at the works of Ime Ebert Upoff um, using a lot of interpretable methods. She's actually on the advisory board for the journal to, um, to, to make scientific conclusions such as storm tracks or moving northward in the, norm, in the Northern hemisphere using techniques from causality. So extremely um, interpretable techniques and corroborated in the climate literature, but from a completely data-driven approach. Okay, thanks for answering that one, Claire. Um, I think um, I think perhaps we should um, perhaps bring bring this webinar to to an end. I just want to sort of thank um, everyone who attended. Um, please do get in touch with us. I'll, um, we will um, post some more details into the chat about um, about about um, how you can uh, find information about the journal. And I wanted to thank all of the all of the editors who've attended, many more than we actually anticipated, which is really great. So thanks everyone for for showing up and for answering these questions. And we'll make this recording um, we'll make this recording available via the journal site and the journal uh, Twitter feed. Um, is there anything that anyone else would like to say to to sign off? Um, perhaps Claire, is there anything you would like to to add? Actually, I just put in the chat. Thanks so much, everyone, for attending in all different time zones. Um, and we really look forward to reading your submissions at the interface of data science and the environmental sciences. Great. Well, um, well with that, with that, that's that's it. Thank you, everyone, for for joining, and um, I hope you have a good rest of the day. And um, please do feel free to get in touch with us. Um, and thanks again. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.